Patricia Pablo from uh, Marana, Dion Swartz from U of A. I have both Yao John Wu and Alyssa Ryan. And from the PAG side of the house, I've got myself, Crystal, Sonia, Dr. Richard Nassi, Hinsu, Josh, Gabe, Jamie, Paul Casertano, and Nathan. And then our guest speaker of Larry Talley from ADOT. Is there anybody I have missed? And I assume the phone numbers I've got on are simply duplicates uh, to ensure that the audio works. Doing one last double check. I don't see anybody. It looks like we are good to go. Okay, well, thank you all. Welcome. It's good seeing you. Uh, go ahead and jump into it and like to turn the presentation over to Hin Su to give an update on the traffic performance evaluation, the measurement activities. As you recall, uh, he's presented to this group over the past couple of years on the efforts he's been overseeing with U of A. So Hin Su, the floor is all yours, my friend. Okay, thank you, Rick. Uh, good morning. Uh, let me just check and uh, I can just move the... Uh presentation slides. Okay, okay, now it works. Okay, good morning, Mr. Chair and the TSSS uh, committee members and uh, above all, thank you. And uh, just I uh, keep updating uh, regarding this kind of just uh, the, uh, the project and uh, we're working together with the university team. And uh, as you know, just uh, my name is Hans, you know, modern manager at PAC. And uh, this is a quick kind of as an update uh, of our just a project. Uh, now I call just a project number one, and uh, then just the first here's the agenda, and the PAX initiatives, and then just we're going to talk about the regional traffic data inventory, and uh, then just the major data sources regarding this project number one, and uh, how we just select those in the major data sources, and uh, for those in the, our just the effort in the, in the project number one. Then just a region-wide application, then just uh, what we are currently working, and uh, here is the ongoing work. Then just uh, we'd like to just talk about and uh, the the purpose of the project number two and uh, working together with the university team. So PACS initiatives, as you know, is the PAC and RTA and the responsibility to improve our regional transportation system working together with you. And uh, so which requires uh, federal requirements. And uh, one of the examples is the traffic count program for just the national HPMS and the update. And uh, also we are really interested in just the uh, recent kind of just the movement and uh, the TISMO and the ITS and uh, how we can incorporate those uh, new items in the planning in the arena. So the, our jurisdiction general partners, the, you guys are actually doing really well and uh, especially for reduce the congestion and the improve the traffic safety issues and uh, and just uh, for many and uh, the uh, the congestion related just using multiple kind of sources of data loop detector camera and uh, even just the other third party just the gps and uh, the data as well so and uh, back we spent like uh, several years in uh, around just two years for this project in the project number one and with these questions in the final our goal was uh, developing just the region-wide traffic volume data to support our traffic count program, which is also related to just the TSMO and ITS and the portion. And uh, so working together with and the jurisdiction partners and the university team. And so finally, we have some just uh, the output outcomes. And uh, this is a uh, really quick update. And the first, the regional traffic sensor data inventory. As you see, this is the based on the update 2020, and uh, you can just uh, click the sensor inventory, just the map if you want, and uh, here. And so, as you know, as you see here, and the uh, jurisdiction has a uh, way different kind of just uh, traffic sensors, and uh, some intersections also have uh, multiple types of sensors. So, considering just the multiple just uh, the uh, options and the con uh, the conditions and the uh, we finally kind of just gathered and uh, maximize the uh, kind of as a benefit and uh, to also curber and the most of just the traffic sensors. And uh, then just we finally decide to just uh, using the uh, two main just data sources and uh, for event-based data. And that uh, there's just the max view system and the my vision volume data. And uh, is the second for just uh, our video-based uh, the data sets. And uh, here just I'd like to just thank you and the city of Tucson for 
uh, us to get those in the data set through just max view, otherwise it's just the Pima County and just the tunnel monitor. And uh, for us to access and uh, to the, the data set. And uh, so here you see that just the left side and uh, of the figures and uh, is a max view and the coverage and the right side is uh, the, uh, the my vision coverage. So total uh, for the max view side and uh, total around just 354 controllers kind of available. Then just uh, so far, at least just the 200 and the intersections with good uh, communication quality. So we kind of just incorporate in this project and uh, to have those, those in the volume data. For my vision data sets and uh, uh, Pima County 109 and the town of Marana, and it shows that just the 13 and the uh, uh, intersections is, and uh, we accessed in the, then here, this is the overall just the data process. And uh, I, I'm trying to give you the high level and the overview. And uh, instead of just the talking about just the, uh, the detailed kind of the, uh, the flows and the procedures developed by just the university team. And uh, this might be a kind of a just a good kind of a just understanding the major just of uh, outcomes. And uh, here you see that just the max view in the database, the my views and database is available. And just our goal is the first goal is to how to get those in the turning movement counts, uh, either from just the max view or just the my vision in the 50 minute and the resolution. So for max view database and uh, uh, we applied just the machine learning algorithm and developed by just the university team and the my vision data set and uh, was just the user directly and that there was just the my vision API to develop those 20, 50 minute turning movement counts. And they're using those and the turning movement counts uh, either from max view or my vision. And the and just the consecutive just the upstream downstream just the intersection turning movement counts available. Then just the, we use those and the turning movement count to estimate just the segment count. So that's the kind of just the, the our just the product and the turning movement count and the segment count estimated through this uh, high level overview. So here's the uh, uh, turning movement count to just the uh, regional application. So total 369 turning movement count locations. Uh, the estimated and the, the, the turning movement count volumes and uh, 200, 263 intersections uh, using just uh, the machine learning algorithm and the, the source to form just the max view and the my vision and the curve is under six intersections. And uh, on the bottom, and they see that just uh, that's the, uh, the output of the whole process and uh, for each intersection and uh, there's a timestamp and uh, all those in the turning and the count and based on the intersection ID and that we have. And when you're just the right side and this figure shows that and uh, one of the just the snapshot in the September 22 average uh, intersection total just the uh, turning count and uh, during just the peak hours. Similar kind of just uh, the uh, uh, example and uh, for just a segment volume estimation and the 358 segment uh, locations uh, estimated and they're using those in the previous in the turning movement count uh, estimated. So here's on the bottom, you see that and those outcomes outputs and uh, for those in the uh, segment ID and for the time, we have just the upstream and the downstream and the volume estimated from those the turning movement counts. Then just the final, just the segment estimation applied based on the upstream, downstream, just the distance weighted by uh, uh, this distance. So here's the right side, and uh, you see the uh, the uh, one snapshot, just the same September 2020, and uh, average and uh, segment uh, volumes during peak hours. So ongoing work, and uh, now just the final report is available at the PAC website. And uh, you can see here in uh, the link, and uh, you can get those in the, the whole, just the, which is more than just 100 pages. But if you are interested in the feel free to go ahead and then just uh, review it. And uh, if you have any feedback, and uh, it is always welcome. 
and uh, the the part as a partial just the outcomes of this project and uh, now just uh, we uploaded 2021 the my vision turning movement counts at the PAC uh, MS2 website and uh, you can find and uh, if just the ID has it just uh, starting with M that's actually just the my vision count and uh, you see just a lot of just the different just the locations and the daily just the patterns and the collected from just the my vision. And uh, internally, just the package is just improving just the procedures and uh, having just the same just a skeleton develop, developed by our university team. And that uh, we are improving just a little by little and uh, to improve over just the process, data process and uh, in terms of just QAQC. And uh, based on this and the update and uh, uh, if you are interested in just that uh, we'd like to just uh, have some follow-up discussion and uh, with our just uh, the uh, jurisdictional partners and uh, about just uh, what parts and uh, is important and uh, for more detailed kind of just analysis and uh, longer one or just one and a half hours in the time. And so based on this, and uh, we are actually just uh, kicked up our just a uh, second project uh, to get working together with the university team, and uh, which is uh, uh, the region wide traffic performance evaluation and performance measure development using multi source data. So based on the project number one, and uh, we discussed so far. And uh, we'd like to kind of just our goal is to investigate the sources of traffic data for regional autismal related traffic data collection, maintenance, and advanced modeling. So targeting is just to develop the cost effective autismal related performance measures. We don't know much about just uh, how much just the data we need. And uh, but the, we'd like to kind of just get some understanding about what kind of just the performance measures to, uh, needed for just a TSMO type of just the planning or just a, a TSMO type of planning effort. So this is uh, uh, what I prepared here, just as a short update. And uh, if you have any question, and uh, I'm happy to answer that. Fantastic presentation as always, Hinsu. Any questions for Hinsu on the materially covered information he shared? I have a question, Rick. Go for it, Dion. Um, I'm wondering whether um, the intent is to replace the regional count program with these new data sources, or will, or is that kind of the long-term plan, or is that part of the plan at all? Yes, that's right. And uh, we'd like to just address then, uh, if possible, just uh, if any just the local data are available. Why not just, uh, but uh, there should be some kind of additional effort to how to just uh, maintain those, uh, the quality data. So it might be just uh, still needed and uh, in terms of just uh, evaluating and uh, current system, but the our kind of just the long-term goal, it could be a kind of just uh, looking for just another just uh, source and uh, maybe just uh, replacing just the current uh, traffic count program with uh, uh, this kind of just uh, the effort. So then part of this study, I'm guessing, um, looked at the quality of the data and what did you find? So, and uh, some pros and uh, some cons and the good portion is the, uh, we can just uh, discuss in the more details and uh, for just the follow-up just uh, discussion, but the overly and uh, reliable and the, but it depends on just the type of sensors and uh, the myovision is relatively good. And uh, just the max view is a good kind of just supplemental, just a data source. And, uh, but there are some just the portions just that we need to just improve. And uh, in the, not only for, not only just the, for the, uh, the max view at the border, so just the, the my vision side. Uh, one more question on this topic. Mm -hmm. um, the Streetlight website, uh, provides ADTs and turning movement counts. Was that evaluated as part of the study? No, and uh, but uh, we actually just uh, yes, actually we reviewed in the, uh, independently, and uh, we also reviewed in the part of uh, this project. And the streetlight data, just at the time, just right now, we are not sure just if they are providing just a 15 minute. And uh, based on the, uh, the, our review for this project, and uh, they only provided just one hour, which was not our just uh, kind of just uh, target. 
also there are some just a discrepancy and uh, especially there are just, especially for the rural area, there are a bunch of kind of just the zero counts and uh, just report it. And, but there are some, uh, for further reasons, just there are some gaps and uh, based on just the, our independent, just the research and uh, uh, you, the uh, comparing to the, uh, the still light data with our just uh, turning movement count and the data set that collected. Then just uh, there are some just a sample issue because of turning movement count and uh, if you want to just uh, look at and the specific just a 15 minute and the time resolution, there are some just the uh, gaps and the uh, up and down. But I don't know just uh, which was uh, studied and uh, back in around just the one, uh, two years ago. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Any other questions for Hinsu? Hinsu, okay. I guess before we move oh, on, go this for is Josh. Josh. Just, uh, I mean, uh, with that study, that deep dive, and I believe it was presented to DSSS, but um, um, of the streetlight data, you felt pretty conf comfortable with the AADT, but less comfortable with the TMC estimates through streetlight, correct? Uh, right. And uh, yes. Okay. So just, yeah, broadly, but, but again, they're continually refining their, their process. So that, that study was relevant for, you know, the scope of uh, the, the date range that we, we did the deep mm -hmm. dive into. So, sorry. Okay. No, good clarification. And thanks for jumping in. Any final and questions? I, I guess just a comment, um, we don't know the algorithms that they use for the streetlight data, and it would be, uh, they probably use the PAG data, is my guess, because some of the numbers that I found are pretty similar to what PAG has. Um, but it would be funny if we kind of created a circular sort of thing where we use streetlight and then they use the PAG data, and it was uh, self-confirming of whatever numbers get generated. Well, I mean, in that process, into the, the in discussing with Streetlight, um, as we dug through it, I mean, they they are they are looking at continuous counts, published continuous counts. So, as um, you know, across the country to 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 train their um, algorithms. So, and also regionally. So that that's honestly that's not a big surprise that they would use any published data to help kind of. Um, train calibrate the their 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 models um and as more continuous count material is available such as through the the myovision or other efforts then that is going to improve uh streetlights data product or other inferred data products so that's not a big surprise what you found no i didn't suggest it was a surprise i i just oh, thought sorry. it would be funny if if we use uh, Streetlight and then You're publish for that, Streetlight. We, yeah, and, they're... and then and then Streetlight uses PAG, yeah. it turns into kind of a circular sort of thing. Right, but they're also able to provide you the the temporal resolution is is a big benefit of those services, right? Yeah, just in case uh, adding up a little bit and uh, they, they have a different product and uh, for the volume estimation and the uh, AADT estimation is kind of just a different and uh, for AADT, they use a continuous count and uh, nationally and uh, just a separate and uh, so like just Josh mentioned, if they now just uh, can get our just the recent update and the my vision and the turning movement counts, they can use that and just uh, much more kind of just uh, the better in the result we see that. And on the other hand, they apply just the, their own kind of a machine learning algorithm and uh, using just the GPS, their standalone GPS data, and uh, which is a source uh, from just uh, any just the vendors or we know is uh, some of the index or just the Weijo and the such kind of a vendors. So they have their own just development team. So maybe there are some just the effort and the calibrate the model based on just the continuous count and, uh, and other sources. That's doable, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay, fantastic as always. Thanks, Insu. Um, thank you.
Next item I've got is just an update on the um, regional safety analysis that we've been asked from TPC. We introduced this to everybody and brought this forward at our last meeting. Uh, so I wanted just to share a quick update on it so you'll let us or so we'll let us, so we can let you know uh, that we're working on it and kind of where we stand right this second. Uh, as we know, safety topic, this is very broad, it's very general, and it was kind of hard to pin things down. Um, our goals have been to all along develop tangible recommendations, tangible items that could be acted on, not just kind of some basic steps that could be eventually thought of or flushed out. So we're trying to take it to that next level amongst the team members here. Um, since our last meeting, uh, we've been going over all kind of the best strategy and trying to poke on this. What's going to be the best tactic? How can we get the data? What do we have available? What's surfacing to the top uh, so that we can bring back specific items for your feedback and discussion? Uh, so right, that's, right this second, as this is shaking out, uh, if you could pencil out and plan on a May 12th meeting, block out 9 to, 12, 9 to 11, our normal time. So normally we go on a bi-monthly cycle, but uh, me and the team think we can bring something back for uh, review, discussion, and evaluation in May. So I'm planting that seed with you now. Where we're at right this second, what we've landed on or what's surfaced to the top, depending on how you look at this, is we're focusing on a two-prong manner, looking at systems on one hand and behavior aspects on the other, okay? For the system side, we're focusing our primary attention on the most problematic aspects, which are the signalized intersections, pedestrians, and bicyclists. Also looking at all accidents, which in turn should help reduce the problematic ones, which are your fatalities and serious, pro or serious injuries. So we've been seeing how that's kind of been surfacing, swirling, and that those have been the problematic aspects that we've seen the biggest effort and attention we can focus on. On the behavioral aspects, we've been trying to reach out to law enforcement, but we have not been making much, much contact or having very much success in getting in touch with them. If you guys in the jurisdiction side have specific law enforcement you deal with on a regular basis related to this topic, you have a regular interactions, progress meetings, updates, discussions, if you could email that contact info to us, uh, we've been reaching out to one of the, the ones we typically work with, but haven't been getting very good responses back. So we know we're going to want to plug that component in to tackle the education enforcement aspect of it. But we recognize there's probably going to be a stagger between the systems aspect and the behavioral one. So send that contact info and we'll share it amongst the team on our uh, As I iterated, so the overall goal then is a set of recommendations. Um, that this group, we basically would bring them back, share them with you, but the goal of this particular group is develop a tangible set of recommendations that we in turn would take to TPC, present to them because they were the originators of the request. When Paul had brought this up as part of the performance measure aspect of it, it had simply been, we need to have answers as to what's happening out there and what we can do about that. So that's our overall goal. So right now, just a high clip summary, wanted to let you, let you know we're working on it. If you have additional questions or want to know more, feel free to reach out to myself and I'll see what I can do to fill you in a little bit more. Why did I disappear? We can still hear you. Oh, good gosh. I've got my yeah, computer. We can, I can still you. see you. We can see you. Yeah, yeah. you're there. My you're, whole thing popped up and said, you're yeah. about to be signed out in two minutes. So if... For whatever reason, I got an update going on or something not working. Paul, if I disappear, if you could take it, run with it, I would appreciate it. Sure. Um, so with that, any questions, uh, like I said before, I, whatever's happening weird on my end, uh, any quick questions or from the team that's working on this, anything I glossed over and that you want to expand and add to? Well, I just did want to clarify that um, we've, We've been a little hesitant to reach out to your law enforcement at the same time. So don't think that they're just not responding to us. We want to get them involved in both a meaningful way and at the right time so that um, we're not inviting them prematurely or uh, getting them involved to not really have a fruitful exchange and input from them. So as we discussed it internally, we had made some uh, initial outreach, uh, but didn't really have 
uh, much meat to that to share with them. And then we discussed it amongst the team and decided, let's check in with the traffic folks, because we know that you are all meeting regularly with your law enforcement. Many of you have scheduled meetings and, and you're doing very tight coordination. So we did want to touch base with you um, and then see uh, who the right folks to reach out to are and also um, kind of introduce to you whether that's a better um, touch point through you um, on our behalf or on behalf of this uh, initiative that's happening on the regional front. We're kind of open to your suggestions. We don't want to just kind of cold call some of the law enforcement folks. If you have good tight relationships with them, we'd rather kind of um, write in on your coattails if that's more appropriate. So give that some thought as you're thinking about who the right folks are um, to reach out to. Um, if it can be a, an introduction uh, from you um, and then we can provide an overview of what is uh, looking to be accomplished with this uh, that that could work real well. And for the the city team that's on the call, um, Laco did kind of have a uh, a connection as as some conversations were taking place this week. So um, there's been a, a recent um, reconnect with the analytics crew down at uh, TPD um, just in the last few days. So for um, for the Tucson folks on the call, um, Blake. Oh, did kind of initiate some of that discussion already. So heads up to that team. And it sounds like Rick may have gotten um, kicked out of his own meeting. So I think that might be a first, but uh, uh, let us know if you have any thoughts either now or in follow-up. Um, we would like to get information from you about the contacts and the right way to uh, touch base with them. And then I think come that uh, May 12 meeting, uh, we should have a pretty good starting point uh, to introduce to all of you and uh, determine what the best step moving that forward is. Any uh, questions or comments on this agenda item? All right. Um, with that, why don't we go ahead and we will uh, move to agenda item five, um, where we have a variety of different uh, safety activities uh, to cover. Um, so first, uh, what I'll do is um, kick it over to Gabe to give us an overview of some of the work going on on the road safety assessment side and uh, let us know what's happening in, in that area. Thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah, in the spirit of the lunatics taking over the asylum and uh, Rick's absence, I'll go ahead and go next. Um, yeah, good to see everybody this morning. Um, just a quick overview of our road safety assessment efforts and activities over the last, uh, well, I was going to give you an update since uh, fiscal year. Uh, so, so far this year, since July 1, <clears throat> I wanted to let everybody know what has been done and sort of what's on tap. Um, and uh, so with that, this fiscal year, we've completed uh, four RSAs um, and participated in a fifth with ADOT um, and, the, and the Tohono O'odham Nation on um, BIA TO Nation <clears throat> IR15. Um, the four we've completed so far is grant uh, the design RSA phases five and six. Uh, we've done a traditional RSA at Congress and Grande. Uh, we've done a traditional RSA uh, for the county at Western Way, um, and we just completed a road safety assessment at design RSA at Grant and the Union Pacific overpass and I-10. Uh, that one was that with that one was very interesting. We got a lot more out of it than we thought, and we got good cooperation from the design team and, and the city. And so we want to reiterate our thanks our thanks to them. Um, up next, we we have. Um, uh, uh, about 10 or so on the on deck as well. Next, we're going to be uh, tackling uh, golf links in Pantano uh, for the city. 
Uh, we also have uh, Gladden Farms uh, from Rana in the mix, and then a, no a number of other um, uh, city RSAs that we're going to be taking a look at. So um, just as a reminder, these are all free to member jurisdictions. We're, we're brought in like consultants on your behalf. Uh, we're working closely with you, um, either in uh, design plans that you have that you're putting together, your, 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 your consultant or design team are helping you put together, uh, or for existing infrastructure, we can go out there in any capacity. So please let us know. Um, and we're happy to continue participating in that. Uh, does anybody have any questions on the, any RSA activities or efforts? Hey, Gabe, it's Dion. Hi, Dion. Hi. Hey, um, just regarding the Gladden Farms uh, <laughs> RSA, uh, we're coming to the end of the school year, so you may want to push that because um, it is a school-related concern. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm assuming it's probably you're probably not going to be able to get to it before the end of the school year. This spring is my guess. Um, if, if you can, that would be great. Um, but then I would advise if you can't do it this spring to push it to the fall when school resumes in August. Okay. Is the, uh, the school uh, shuts down mid May? Is that, would that be a correct assumption? Mid late May? Uh, yeah, I don't know exactly, but it's kind of the same as everybody <laughs> else's schedule. School, school sure. starts like the first week in August nowadays. Right. Right. Uh, if we can't get to it before uh, the first half of May, then we will suspend that one and, and push it back to the fall. Thanks for the heads up, Dion. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions for anybody? Hey, Gabe, it's Rick. I just got back on through a uh, phone connection. Oh, hey, so, um, nope, thank you for, for covering it. Um, you went over the ones that you've been doing today, correct? Went over those and then some of the ones we're planning on doing, yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay, good. I jumped in just as you were wrapping up and uh, saying it's available to the region still and we can uh, accommodate workload coming up. So perfect. And thank you. Yep. yep. We, we do. We do have, uh, we've got a list, but please don't hesitate to, to, to get into the queue. Right. Good deal. Any uh, follow up question or anything else for Gabe on the RSA? So just a quick question and just to plant the seed i know we've had a little bit of internal uh discussion about uh the benefit of the program and the um uh the struggles through pandemic and it seems like it's coming back strong and there's a, a substantial queue of um locations in the hopper that to me kind of indicates that there's um real tangible value there for our um uh, local agencies. And so as we look forward into the future, I guess I would just plant the seed with the local agencies. If this is indeed um, a valuable program to you, uh, it never hurts for us to hear that. And I know that internally we've talked about um, what we need to look at in order to keep this program going, uh, to keep these services uh, something that we can provide for all of you. So Gabe's done a good job um, planning that out with available funding and, and such. So we'll continue to do that, those considerations internally. Um, but uh, uh, if there's value there, uh, please keep letting us know so that we can gauge uh, our future steps on um, providing these kind of <clears throat> services as we move forward. And to add to that, if there's additional, if you've gone through these, if you've experienced them, you've worked on those different ones, uh, and you've got different thoughts, uh, things to add, or uh, specialized elements to investigate, Gabe's got an incredibly refined protocol, uh, but we try to make sure it's always up to date, latest and greatest, using latest thinking, latest logic, all that type of stuff. So if there's additional tools you're aware of, yep. any of those refinements on top of what Paul is asking for, make sure you shoot that over to us as well. Yeah, and I know that Gabe's done a great job aligning the uh, RSA recommendations with the crash modification factors uh, that are appropriate, and Josh has done tremendous work to do that within the Safety Explorer tool. So we're trying to make it um, much more actionable um, recommendations within the program and the analysis tool. So those are the kind of steps that we've heard are helpful to you. The more that we hear from you, what works and what's of value, uh, the better we can refine the program and the services. 
Back to you, Rick. Perfect, and thank you. Um, next item up under the safety umbrella is going to be an overview presentation uh, on the HSIP, the uh, latest call for projects. You've probably seen by now a couple of emails from Gabe going out announcing it. We're getting things geared up on our end to be able to uh, lead this and support it. But wanted to have Larry Talley from ADOT uh, provide a presentation, share the approach, share the program, and give the overview of everything that everybody needs to see. So, Larry, the floor is yours. And is Larry still there? Looks like he is still listed, um, muted. So I'm not sure if that's it. And then I'm not sure if we have his presentation or if the plan was for him to screen share. We had both options. He could either screen share as Crystal also has it available too. So Larry, we've got backup in case it would be easier to have us present and then have you narrate. Why don't why don't we start the process of loading that up, Crystal? If you don't, if you can do that, if you don't mind, um, just getting that up there, just and we'll uh, we'll we'll give we'll give Larry another minute to unmute. I wonder if he went through the same thing I did. We're just kind of hey, updates kicked out. Uh, we did hear that Jamie Brown uh, did go through a full system restart. So there was a sig significant, <laughs> I don't know if it was a Microsoft update or what it was, but. Um, yeah, mine came up as Microsoft based. You're not alone, Rick. I, that's good because I was really like, wow, what am I doing wrong on this end? Um, well, I'll tell you what, because I want to hear from Larry, and if he's going through something similar, my system is struggling to come back up, so it's entirely possible on that. What we can do is come back on that and jump ahead to item number six, which is our traffic uh, signal, all the communications update we get from all the jurisdictions. So we can buy Larry some time on that if that works for everybody. Any objections? No, no objections. Hearing none. Okay. Anybody from Tucson on board? When I was doing the check-ins earlier, I didn't notice anybody, so Hi, I don't know if somebody's jumped in late. Francisco, I'm on. Hey, Francisco, how you doing, man? What you got for an update on what you've got going on? Uh, not much. We had the, just had a build delay with the money we got from PAC to do the fiber. So we're working through those issues. Otherwise, we're still planning and moving from our old system into an old Verizon solution in the meantime. And that's slowly working out also through ADOT approval. Some radios. Now, if I remember right, this was the Tropos radio system transition over to Verizon. You've been talking about this for the last couple of years, correct? This is the continuation of that? Yeah, it's a, it's a need, but the Tropos is completely dead. That's been dead for a few years. What we uh, still have with SmartWave is the WiMAX system. That was a replacement for Tropos. And so oh, we're God, maybe I'll get my systems mixed up. guys to move out of that, but that needs ADA approval, so we're working through that. Okay. All righty. That's all I got. Um, Pima can't. Oh, go ahead. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. That's all I got. That's all you got. Okay, good. Um, Lauren, I saw you joined on. What's PC dot got going on? Yeah, no new updates or information as of today. DJ, uh, I thought you had jumped on. Uh, what do you got going on? Any changes, communications, any um, new developments on your end? Uh, no, not really. Uh, still waiting for uh, City of Tucson to get their Verizon thing going on because I guess I get to ride on their coattails, I think. But anyway, that's about it. Okay, ready.
Uh, Dion, how about on your end? Um, we're making a purchase for some radios and switches by the end of the fiscal year, and we think that we could pull in um, the three or four signals um, that are not connected uh, using that equipment. Um, I, I also have some money budgeted for next fiscal year as well, so um, we're doing pretty good. Um, what would be lagging behind potentially are the MaxView licenses, um, but that's also in the works, and I believe you're going to report on that. Um, we have some pretty major construction happening at Ina and Silver Bell. Uh, we lost some communications connectivity as a result of that, but um, Mike Washburn here was able to bypass that signal using some radio communications that we had. So we're back online, um, except for Ina Silver Bell. It was kind of a, um, an intersection that was a lot of other intersections were being pulled through, um, but now we're bypassing it. So pretty pleased with uh, how well that worked out. So essentially that one's just operating as a standalone um, in whatever its offline capacity is? Yeah. Understand that right? Okay. So that's all. Okay, perfect. Um, Paul Burton, Salarita. Anything in you on your front? Uh, Paul or Crystal, do you still see Paul Burton on? Hi, can you hear me now? Yep, got you loud and clear. Go for it. All right, perfect. We just installed um, two more traffic link systems, or MyoVision, that gives us at least basic alarms with our uh, intersection. So now we have one at Salrita Road and Rancho Salrita Boulevard, and one at Duval Mine Road at La Quinata. And so in another 20 years, I'll have communications with everything. <laughs> On the 20-year plan. Okay, that's good. <laughs> All righty. Um, I never saw hey, Rich, if can Jay you hear Gomes... Me oh. I'm sorry, pardon me? Rick? Can you hear yeah. me by any chance? Is that you, Larry? Yeah. Yeah, okay. We, <laughs> um, <laughs> I was on the phone and that's the first time it's never let me uh, uh, do a dialogue through the phone so i managed to get into the computer okay i'll tell you what give us two seconds because i'm going to come back to you um did okay. does anybody know if jay gomes was able to log in i am not seeing him not seeing jay okay no all right I didn't see him earlier, so. Okay, um, that's the, any questions for any of the folks that did share updates um, on what they've got going on, any follow-up or anything else to add from uh, the jurisdiction reps? Okay, hearing none. Larry, we still got you, can you hear us okay? Yep, I'm still here. Okay, you got Larry Talley uh, on. And uh, what I'm going to try to do here is let's see if I can share my screen. Crystal can pull the presentation up Would on our end if okay. that's helpful. And can you see mine now? Paul and Crystal, did it come up okay? Yeah, we're seeing it. Yes. Got it? Okay. Larry, the floor is all yours, my friend. All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, Mona couldn't join us today, and so I've got it all by myself. Uh, my name is Larry Talley. I'm the HCEP Program Manager for ADOT. Uh, and the purpose of my briefing this morning is just to bring you guys up, uh, up to date on the status of the 25-26 HSIP uh, call for projects. Uh, specifically, we issued our initial call for projects uh, back on February 28th. It was a little late in the ball game, primarily because we were waiting to see what the new uh, IIJA 
or the new uh, transportation bill was going uh, to do to the program. Uh, we knew there were going to be changes, but we didn't know what they were. And we wanted to try to get them incorporated into the 2526 call for projects. Um, unfortunately, if you see the third bullet down there, the appropriations, although the federal government appropriated additional funds for the HSIP program, it did not increase the ADOT HSIP obligation authority, which means that in 22, 23, 24, 25, and 26, we're still being held at the $40 million a year uh, cap. Uh, because of projects uh, not getting executed in the 22-23 program, uh, we had to slide some projects out to the 25-26 program because that was the first year that we had any funds available. As a result of that, we only have $24 million available in FY25 and $35 million available in FY26. Um, that's not to say that we're, we're still not having discussions with uh, the individuals who uh, in ADOT who may have some influence, hopefully have some influence on the uh, state transportation board uh, so that they will give us uh, additional obligation authority so we can in, in, increase our program. Uh, the last bullet down there is just to say that uh, our projects continue, all applications continue to be uh, ranked based on the benefit to cost ratios. If anybody has any questions, please uh, you know, interrupt me because I'm trying to fly through this as fast as I can. Uh, before I get into the changes of the 2526 uh, application process, uh, I just want to touch on some lessons that we learned and have to say we learned them the hard way. Uh, in almost every case, anticipated cost estimates were underestimated. That both went for the state and uh, the local uh, projects. Unfortunately, the way the state five-year program works, we are required to program all of our funds uh, in the five-year program. And when we do that, that does not allow us to have uh, flexibility uh, to come for agencies to come back in and ask for additional funds. We just don't have it. The only way that happens is if a project falls out of the program and we free up some funds in the program uh, to be able to, uh, to provide additional funds to local agencies or state agencies. Uh, we didn't anticipate the inflation rates that were going to occur. We only had a 5% inflation rate in our 2324 uh, program. Based on the guidance that we were given, or not necessarily given, but we did it, went out and inquired uh, to our uh, FMS uh, group, uh, we came up with a 4.5 yearly increase for the 2526 program. So if you look in the new applications, you're gonna see that for design, there, we, we put in a 13.5% increase uh, for inflation and in the construction, because it's a year later, we put in 18%. Those numbers are not locked in. Uh, if you feel the numbers are too high or too low, you're more than welcome to change them. Uh, we just remind everybody that again, if you uh, put less in, and your your project estimates, or your you know when you get to your final uh, design estimates, and you need more money, there's just not going to be any more money available, and it's going to have to come from another source. Because uh, as I've stated, we're program when we program, we program out. Uh, we ran into several projects that the substructures were found to be unsuitable for the countermeasures, i.e., uh, centerline and shoulder rumble strips. So we strongly encourage the local agencies to go out and make sure that uh, that wearing surface or, or is capable of accepting uh, the ground in rumble strips uh, three or four years down the road, uh, or that you're going to take action 
to improve the surface prior to the rumble strips being put in. And we've had a couple of agencies who asked their projects be delayed so they could do that. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, PHB seemed to be the automatic go-to solution for pedestrian fatalities. Uh, there were no uh, cases where agencies went to crosswalks or uh, RHVs, rapid, uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacons prior to going into a hawk. So we've included a, uh, uh, an, an extra step in the uh, process in the 2526 program. And we also had uh, instances, instances of JPH being executed so late in the design physical year that uh, our project management group did not have time to go out, go through the process they have to go through to bring a consultant on board to do the designs. And so as a result, we had to delay those projects to a later physical year. Uh, and as a result, we, uh, we put new guidance in uh, uh, our manual or Appendix A to our manual. Basically, we say that the JPAs have to be in place prior to the state physical year that the project is going to be designed. That just gives us plenty of lead time uh, to get um, the consultants on board, get the kickoff meetings and everything ready to go for the designs. And uh, if we run in, we, we've had projects delayed because they ran into utility problems, uh, 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 street uh, signals. Uh, they didn't realize that uh, they didn't have the space in the right of way to set the controller and they had to come back, at, uh, come back in and request uh, right of way purchase. And so it just delayed projects. So, uh, we, we, we've addressed that in the new. Okay, let me get to the changes I'm talking about. Hey, uh, hey Larry, the, this is, uh, this, is sure. Gabe, this is Gabe Thumb from PAG. Yep. Um, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but um, you had mentioned no, that no. for the, for, thank you, uh, for, the, for the PHBs, you had mentioned that there's an, an additional step that's been added to the process for this go around. Um, since, since PHBs and their, their use are pretty prevalent here in our region, can you elaborate a little bit more on what that extra step is? I'll, I have a slide on it. I'll get to it in a minute, Gabe. Perfect, thanks. Okay, okay. Uh, the first major implication in the, in the new program is that all draft applications must be submitted for review. Uh, the purpose in that is we're, when we get, when we say a draft application, we're really looking at the scope of work, uh, the, uh, uh, scope of work, the cost estimate, and the crash modification factors of the BC ratio. What we want to do, or what we will do, is we have agreements with uh, the project management group, who these projects are going to be going to, to take a look at your cost estimates to see if they see any significantly or any uh, varying errors, or they feel omissions that have been made to the, um, to the application or in the application. What we will do is then we will uh, collect all of the uh, comments and put them together, consolidate them, and send them back out to the local agency. Local agency then will have a month to consider making the changes to their application or not making the applications before the final applications are due. Uh, again, uh, we're, we're trying to cut down on uh, the the cost estimates to make sure that they are as close to being correct as, as we can make them. None of us have a crystal ball, so we don't know what's going to happen in three years from now when we uh, finally start putting together the uh, project initiation packet to get these things kicked off for design. So uh, it's just one more step uh, that had been recommended by uh, several different groups within ADOT to, uh, to try to make the, the process uh, work more uh, cost effectively. Um, the step requirements added, this is what I was talking about, Paul. I've got another slide right after this that shows you the step. Uh, we added the project initiation timeline. That was where I was talking about uh, the lessons learned that we've got to get the JPAs in place prior to 
the uh, start of the fiscal year that the project's going to be designed. Uh, lead agencies, this really doesn't impact on you all. I don't think you had any multi-agency projects. Uh, this was primarily in the MAG region where when, <laughs> when the when the rubber met the road, the lead agencies kind of uh, waffle on pulling together all the agencies that were involved in uh, in that particular project. Uh, as uh, the local agencies may not be aware that uh, the state has safety uh, performance targets, the, the COGS and MPOs, am I right on that? Uh, the the uh, have to put together or accept the state safety performance targets. Uh, that is a requirement by the feds for that HSET program. If we don't make significant progress toward our performance goals, we are required to uh, reprogram funds to, uh, uh, well, we're required to assess our, our, why we didn't make progress toward those goals and come up with a program or a set of projects to move the state toward those goals. And that may require us to reallocate some funding or uh, move projects around to fit those to particular targets that we're having uh, to try to meet. So unless it kicks in, it doesn't impact on our program. If it does kick in, uh, then it may influence uh, some of our funding uh, of projects. The new uh, transportation bill added a special rule, uh, which is vulnerable road users uh, guidance. And it's uh, if, if the uh, vulnerable road users, which are your pedestrians, bicyclists, uh, basically your uh, non-motorized users, exceeds, if, if, if it's 15%, uh, and we have, to, if the vulnerable road users exceed 15% of the uh, total fatalities in the state, then we have to uh, ensure that 15% of our funds are spent on the vulnerable road user program. Uh, we think we're okay on that right now, but uh, for, for 23, but we may uh, have to issue some guidance for, for the out years. And Appendix D, there's a lot of non-infrastructure in the new transportation bill, such as uh, red light, well, red light cameras are not infrastructure, uh, non-infrastructure, but uh, enforcement. We now can fund enforcement. Uh, so if local agencies uh, and their, uh, their police departments want to come in and uh, for funds to for overtime for uh, enforcement that is now un eligible we we show it as under under development here because we're just not sure quite yet how we're gonna approach that um, I can't remember if I have a slide in here on on some of the other non-infrastructure projects but we have all that information up on our web page uh, okay, here is the, um, uh, here is the, I, I don't know if I can, get, okay, there we go. Uh, here is the step, uh, the step guide for Ever Pedestrian. Basically what this does is um, it walks you through a process to determine what is the, the most cost-effective countermeasure for the ADT and the roadway characteristics that you have where you're wanting to place the hawk. Um, and as part of that on paragraph, uh, page A5, paragraph nine, uh, is a re field review form. And we are now requiring the field review form uh, be submitted with the HSIP application so that we know that uh, the agency has walked through this process. This is a, uh, this is a, it's the ADOP step guide is off of a federal uh, program and uh, a guidance and is how, how it's developed. It, this is not under uh, the HSIP program. This is under MPD and 
pedestrian bicyclist uh, section is the group that's responsible for this particular document. So uh, uh, you can you can find uh, you can you you can find this document at the web page at the at the URL that's shown here. Uh, okay, as as I was saying a little bit earlier, basically the new uh, transportation bill left the HSIP eligibility guidance in place as it was. So any countermeasure that was eligible in the past is still currently eligible. What it did, it it uh, expanded it and include automated enforcement programs, which are your red light cameras, the non-federal share for transport. So the 5.7% of the uh, NSTAP <laughs> uh, projects can be funded uh, using HSIP funds. And then we have specific safety projects, which here are the, now the non-infrastructure projects that are HSIP eligible. Uh, programs or projects that promote public awareness, uh, enforcement, equipment to support emergency services, safety-related research to evaluate experimental safety countermeasures, and safe routes to school non-infrastructure-related activities. Uh, there is a separate section of the bill that uh, is specifically address the safe routes to school. Uh, it requires the state to uh, have a full-time uh, safe, safe routes to uh, school coordinator, and it also provides funds to that program. But HSIP can be used as a supplemental program to, uh, to support safe routes to school. As I said, all this type of project we haven't figured out how we're going to do a call for projects for these uh, because it's going to take a separate type of application. And we have to be careful with this one in that much of this work is already funded through the governor's office of highway safety. And we want to make sure that we don't duplicate programs uh, with GOHS. So uh, there'll be more information and potentially another call for projects to come out with this non-infrastructure work. Uh, so the revised anticipated, anticipated milestones, if you set through our uh, webinar that we had uh, back in February uh, or in, uh, in the first of March, uh, you, you'll see that these are different dates. The key date that we need to focus in on uh, right now is the May 31st draft, draft applications. That doesn't require the cover letters, signatures. Uh, uh, again, we're primarily looking at the cost estimates, the scope of work, uh, and to make sure that uh, the application is going to be eligible to compete for funding. So then uh, we'll, we'll get you the comments back out by uh, June 30th. In August 1st, the final applications are due. Uh, in October, we'll have the HSIP Safety Committee approval. And then by January of 2023, we'll, uh, the project list will be submitted, submitted, submitted for the tentative five-year program. So again, uh, a lot of the flexibility that we had in the HSIP program has been taken away from us in that we have to go to the final, uh, you, you know, the projects are now included in the tentative five-year program. Uh, when, when it's included in the program, if a project changes, the project manager now has to go to the project review board uh, to get approval. So, uh, you know, we being the traffic safety section, HSEP program, do not have the authority once a project has been approved and has been executed for design, the, the, the authority to change the program. It has to go to the uh, uh, project review board. Larry, is that um, uh, appropriate uh, for all projects beyond H HSIP that PRB serves that function to oversee the scope change? Yeah. Okay, yes. that's what I figured. I just wanted to confirm. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
just want to remind everybody that the uh, strategic uh, transportation or traffic safety plan is the document that HSIP fundings has to support. Uh, that is by uh, statute. And so the only way a project can be eligible is that it supports an emphasis area and a strategy that has been identified in the strategic trans, uh, traffic safety plan. That plan was developed by the, the, by the committees uh, that were established under uh, the guidance of the uh, ADOT director, the health services director, uh, uh, FHWA uh, admin AZ administrator, uh, uh, I think we get DPS uh, commander, uh, there's five and I'm missing somebody, uh, that put the plan together. I mean, they have the committees that are, that are comprised, the committees come up uh, with the plan, and then the plan actually goes to the governor and the governor signs off on the plan. So in the 2014 strategic tra uh, traffic safety plan, we had 14 emphasis areas and pretty much everything was covered in that. Uh, in the 2019 plan, uh, it was felt that 14 emphasis areas was way too many. And so they limited us to the five emphasis areas that are shown on the screen. Your driver behavior, and that primarily uh, addresses speeding. Uh, if you look at the strategies that came out of the governor's office on that, they're putting in uh, variable speed limit signs uh, and all of it primarily deals with trying to slow down the driver through uh, electronic electronics, uh, variable speed signs, uh, uh, feeds, uh, speed feedback signs and, and in congested areas and in work zones and that sort of thing. So driver behavior is one area. Intersections are pretty much wide open. Uh, any uh, improvement to your intersection is eligible. Lane departure crashes, you've got to have run off the road or uh, you know, uh, head-on crashes or sideswipe opposite direction where a vehicle has left its travel lane and, and gone over into the other travel lane. Projects that, that will reduce those types of crashes are eligible. Pedestrians, notice bicycle was not included in that. It's pedestrian uh, type projects and then safety data related projects or, and that's collection of data or uh, analysis of data. So those are the five emphasis areas that your projects can fall under or have to fall under. Okay, this is, the, uh, this is our website. It has, uh, it has copies of our manuals, appendices, uh, helpful documents. We did put together a document where we, where we researched recent types of projects such as rumble scripts, uh, PHVs, uh, signals, uh, roundabouts that have been constructed using funds and, and not only HSET funds, but other funds that have been constructed in the last few years. We put together the design costs, the, uh, the construction costs, the bids that were submitted on those projects so that uh, the agencies can look if they're building a roundabout, uh, a low speed roundabout, they can go in, they can look at what a road speed roundabout uh, cost that was completed in 2019 and look and see if their cost is in line with that. Should be more because we've had so much inflation. But if it's lower than that, we hope people are going to take a look at it and uh, uh, you know use that as uh, a reference to help them make sure that their cost estimates are are uh, in line with what we feel uh, or that uh, the project should cost. With that, I'll say thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, present this. And if you have any questions, please uh, uh, sound off or. Uh, send me a text or email. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate the opportunity. Fantastic, Larry. Thanks for jumping in. Um, any questions for Larry on what he covered or the program in general? Gabe, 
if you can just simply add some of the things that you're going to be overseeing as we start our efforts up on this, just as a quick uh, to supplement what Larry presented, uh, that would be great. So everybody will kind of know what our role and your activities and efforts are going to be in this. Sure, no problem. Um, our our, our activity is going to be uh, extremely similar to the last go around, which is um, if any member jurisdiction is interested in pursuing HSIP funds, uh, we're going to be helping uh, those member jurisdictions, uh, first of all, identify what projects would be um, eligible, um, what projects would be good competitors, and then we're working with them on project um, selection itself and figure out what's going on at these locations. And of course, using the criteria that that ADOT has helped established here um, for these HSIP funds. Um, and then we're gonna, as the, the, the last step, we're gonna have help put together the applications themselves. So we're gonna step through that, that process um, and we should be able to <clears throat> get draft applications um, to Larry and team uh, by the end of May. So, um, and, and Larry touched on it, but just so everyone is clear on it, um, that really is a great way for us to see as opposed to in years past where maybe, you know, the deadline was, you know, uh, July 1 and we'd submit it, uh, submit an application and then we'd find out after the fact it wasn't eligible and then it was, well, how do we, can we go back? And is the, can we extend the timeline? Instead of dealing with that, um, ADOT now is very wisely um, looking at the applications in advance to say, hey, this, this isn't eligible or, or this is eligible except for this one thing or say something isn't eligible unless you change it to, to X, Y, or Z. So it gives them a chance to give us some good input prior to the submission process, um, which helps us adjust as needed to have the most successful applications. And just so it also doesn't waste anybody's, any, anybody's time, doesn't waste their time. Um, you know, they're, they're reviewing, we're putting this together for the region. They're looking at um, applications from all over the state. So they've got quite an influx and quite a lot they've got to look at. This gives them a, a chance to, to get ahead of the game. Paul, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, so uh, I just wanted to speak to the issue of, Larry, the, the five emphasis areas within the state safety plan, um, while they're broad and provide a lot of opportunity, I guess I'm curious about a few years back, I know that many of the COGS and MPOs decided um, that they wanted to develop their own regional safety plans. And I know for us, uh, while our emphasis areas align fairly tightly with the state emphasis areas at the time, that was when the state uh, had uh, identified all 14. So the concerns that we had were if there are um, bicycle issues in our area that we believe are warranted by the data analysis, um, however, we're not um, eligible to propose a uh, any projects uh, to utilize HSIP, that puts the region or the local area in a little bit of a difficult situation um, in that they're not um, wholly able to go after their data-driven safety performance needs. So I don't necessarily need you to speak to it, but I just want to put it out there that I think that continues to be a little bit of a concern. And I know that... Uh, um, my involvement this time around in the update of the state safety plan in 2019 was um, uh, limited and I was not involved, but I, I still understand that the uh, executive committee and the oversight committee did not include um, either um, COG MPO level folks or local agency reps. So I think, I think that um, connection can be strengthened for sure to make sure that the uh, HSIP dollars that come to Arizona are truly addressing the needs to improve safety on all public roadways for all data-driven safety needs. So, um, soapbox, for, soapbox removed, and I will uh, <laughs> turn my video off now, but thanks for listening. Dion, you had something you want to add? Yeah, a uh, question for Larry, I guess. Um, it looks like there's an additional step that has been introduced this cycle for the pedestrian hybrid beacons. And I'm wondering, um, this additional step, um, whether 
this is the only category of projects or type of project that this additional step has been established for, um, whether there's other categories of projects, types of projects, construction projects that ADOT has determined it appropriate to add additional steps to question the, the agency's decision to move forward on a particular project type. It, it seems like singling out pedestrian hybrid beacons for this additional like evaluation, it does a couple things. One is it it makes it seem like getting across the street is easy, and it's not actually. Um, and it seems like as well that ADOT does not favor pedestrian hybrid beacons. So I'm wondering, um, are there other project types that ADOT has determined that it's necessary for the ADOT to question the decision-making process by the agency? Um, a little bit more information about that, I guess. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I would just, I, I don't know the correct term here. Uh, I would think that we added that one step to the PHP. I, I can give you the exact example of why that was added. Uh, there was uh, a project underway to install a pedestrian hybrid beacon uh, in the uh, Metro Phoenix area. And uh, the state traffic uh, safety engineer happened to go out there and they realized that the volume of traffic out there, that it was a waste of money to put that out there. They had had one fatal uh, pedestrian crash about, I think, three years ago. So what they ended up doing was going back to the agency and saying, you know, putting a uh, pedestrian hybrid beacon, the cost to put that out there uh, is not worth it. Why didn't you go and put in as we ultimately ended up with a rapid flashing beacon? And, and basically the agency said, oh, we never thought about that. Uh, so that was sort of what brought it on. That may also come back to apply to uh, bicycle or uh, multi-use path crossings, if we ever get to the point of where, uh, you know, bicycles get back into the program. Uh, but that's the only one. I mean, you've got to have your, uh, you have to have a warrant. You're, if you're putting a signal, it has to meet the warrant before uh, you can install the signal and we require a copy of the warrant. So uh, it was just felt that it was a process that was needed to get people to take a look at uh, other alternatives than PHB, uh, you know, uh, for uh, pedestrian safety countermeasure. This location in Phoenix, was it a multi-lane crossing? Because I have some serious concerns about using flashing lights to get people across multiple lanes of travel, because you basically just repeat the same problem that you have with marked crosswalks? Uh, no, I don't. I think it was, uh, it was two lane with a two way left turn lane, I believe. Uh, but I can tell you, we have uh, multiple, uh, have the rapid flashing beacons on four lane, uh, arterials here in the city of Mesa and uh, you know I and I go through there every day and every day when those uh, flashing beacons come on traffic stops and for both the bicyclists and, and the pedestrians you know, of course you, every now and then you're going to get one somebody who's going to run it but uh, for the majority I'd say 95 percent of the traffic they stop for them. yeah and I, I also think that there's a, a lawsuit in the Phoenix area regarding that uh, rapid flash beacon application on a multi-lane situation. Okay, I'm not aware in it. Uh, yeah, fortunately, uh, this is Gabe again. Yeah, fortunately we have, we don't have to rely on, on anecdotal um, 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 
anything anecdotal to, to, to go forward. We have studies and they show that, you know, the RRFB has, has fairly good uh, yielding to it. It's, uh, uh, I think the issue is, and I think this is what you're hitting on, Dion, is it, it's very contextual. If it's a uh, low speed, two lane crossing uh, with low ADTs, uh, then, you know, it's, and if it's in a, you know, a, usually a constrained urban environment, the yielding's pretty high on RRFBs. Um, the problem is once you start stretching from that, um, at least the, the study from TTI showed that the variability of yielding really could go from like 14, as low as 14% up to 90%. And so there's a giant window, and but the the fourteen percent is when you get to a multi lane road when the speeds increase when the ADTs go, start going up, um, and the really high yielding rates are are um, are those two lane roadways are those low speed roadways. So it's uh, I think that's a, a good question, Dion, and, and definitely ripe for dis for discussion. Yeah, because what it sounds like, I mean, you have the whole uh, B over C ratio process that H zip relies upon, and that determines whether it the, the project um, meets the criteria. That's why ADOT establishes that it has to have a, it has to meet certain requirements for B over C. And it sounds like one single individual walked out there and said, no, this is not the project that should be done here. Do something different. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's introducing. And so then as a consequence, because of this one individual, now ADOT has created an additional step that focuses on a single um, project type. Um, and it sounds like maybe that was not really a data-driven decision, but a decision based on maybe the biases of a, just one individual in ADOT. And that's not a good way to be making decisions, if you ask me. No, I, I, I gotta correct that. I, I said, I mean, that's who we get our guidance from. That was an RSA that was going on out there and the RSA was for the roadway segment that that particular uh, project was going in on. And when they were out there, they looked at it. And uh, that's that's that was a uh, a senior management decision, not you know just a single individual. Um, hi, this is Mona. Can you hear me? Yep, we got you live and clear, Mona. This is Mona Aglan-Swick. I'm with ADOT Traffic Safety. On this uh, specific example, uh, the RSA uh, team um, did not observe any pedestrian in this location for um, almost uh, three to four hours. And then we went back to check the documents and we found out that the pedestrian count that was done on this location was uh, using a predicted methods. It was not an actual count. Uh, so in the future, we would like to see um, uh, the methods that used to calculate the pedestrian, and we'd like to see more documents. Um, so uh, that is uh, what started the issue on that location. Um, on other uh, projects that ADOT is taking a closer look at, or uh, HSIP applications, when it's going to be submitted by the locals, uh, some examples, uh, rumble strips requests, we are going to take a look closer on the condition of the road uh, because we had to delay and defer uh, several projects that requested rumble strips because the pavement condition was not uh, acceptable. And also if we receive applications that request design cost more than uh, construction cost, we're no longer gonna accept something um, in uh, this nature um, and uh, or uh, 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 for example, a roundabout that will cost $1 million. Um, from our experience, uh, we have had uh, some cost estimating issues on roundabouts. So there is some uh, situation that we will be uh, taking a close look at uh, in future applications based on um, lesson learned from the past. Thank you. Good deal. Thanks, Mona. Hello, Rick. Richard Nassi here. Go ahead. Uh, this information is for ADA. There's two big points I'd like to bring forward. I, uh, I support Dion completely. We want data-driven analysis and all these types of crossings. And I want to make sure that ADA fully appreciates uh, two particular points. Uh, one, <clears throat> if you use a uh, hawk operation, uh, basically 
uh, take a look at some of the work that's been done by the city of Tucson and the, and the town of Sarita. They have solar powered hawk operations. And those particular hawks are um, only about a few thousand dollars more than a flashing uh, a rapid uh, rectangular rapid flash beacon. So with the extra few thousand dollars, they get a guaranteed higher compliance rate. The uh, other point I wanted to bring out, is, so they, they best not be looking at the money issues uh, directly because a rectangular rapid flash beacon and a better and a solar powered hawk are pretty much the same cost, but with the solar powered hawk, you get a high compliance rate always in the 97, 98, and 99% level. With, with the rectangular rapid flash, you get a great variance in the compliance rate. The second point is, if you expect to use it at a location where bicycles are crossing under Arizona law, the bicyclist can push the button and start the rectangular rapid flash, but there's no duty upon the approaching driver to stop and yield to a bicyclist because the bicyclist is the vehicle. If you want to stop for the bicyclist, the vehicle to stop for the bicyclist, then you shall put up a red light device. And that gets back to the lawsuits that are going on in Florida right now and why Federal Highway was asked to change the rectangular rapid flash to a red beacon, which they cannot do and won't do. And that's why they told them to start using the Hawk or a standard uh, traffic signal operation. And remember that was also on a two lane uh, system right there by the beach down at, I think it was A1A and a young child was struck and killed the uh, day before Christmas. Pushed the button, started the rectangular rapid flash. The child started to cross, but the driver didn't yield. The whole point of this is one, if you're looking, if you're thinking that a rectangular rapid flash beacon is less expensive than a Hawk, that's not correct if you use the new devices that have been uh, researched and developed by Tana Sarita and the city of Tucson. And two, if you're gonna expect it to be used at a location where they have bicycle crossings, that is in conflict with the state law because drivers don't have to yield to the bicycles, the bicycles have the duty to stop. I think we're starting to diverge into now specific items, um, which are worth the discussion because they are included in some of this. But the whole point of this was simply more focused on the process aspects from Larry, Mona, ADET, ADET, ADOT, and then our helpful administration on that. So I'm going to kind of interject on there and kind of pull us back to if there's any questions regarding more of the process requirements, how we're going to go about that, or what uh, the efforts Gabe will be leading going forward. Appreciate the discussion, but I don't want to diverge just too much and stray away from the topic. Gabe, any closing thoughts you want to offer up, or you're going to be in touch with folks as we go forward on this? Yeah, the contract package just went through, um, so we're good to go. We'll, we'll be contacting uh, uh, staff at the jurisdictions that are interested in, in participating um, and applying for the HSIP uh, funding this, this go around. Um, I will say that there's more funding uh, than last time. Um, it's a big pot. We were uh, pretty successful the last, uh, the last call for projects um, and, uh, you know, I, I encourage our member jurisdictions to please uh, strongly consider this. Um, and if you're on the fence about this, please give me a call. I'm happy to talk to you about it. Uh, we recognize that there are some constraints. Um, there's some hoops that need to be jumped through, um, not only for the application process, but um, when actually once the money has been acquired and going through and, and, and going through all the, the, the federal and state requirements. So we recognize that, but we still think that there's great value here in the program and, and what, um, uh, Larry and Mona and Carrie and their whole safety section, what they're, what they're trying to do uh, uh, with us down here. So please don't, don't hesitate to give us a call. Otherwise we'll be in touch with you soon. Um, let us know. Fantastic. Okay, cool. Larry, thanks a million for jumping in Mona as well. And Gabe for helping to handle that overview and get everybody caught up to speed on that. 
Um, those are the last of the items I've got. Uh, and that was the last of the part with a little shuffling and rejuggling on that. A uh, couple things I want to let you guys know. Right now, we'll plan on a regular meeting, our normal cycle in June. But pencil out that date in May, the 12th, that I mentioned for a specific focus meeting talking about the safety aspects. That's our goal on our team is to try and come through, have something that we represent, share, and be ready to discuss for feedback, evaluation, suggestions, comment, and discussion. Any last questions on the items we've talked about on the agenda? For any of the presenters that come that talks? Hearing none, I'm gonna go ahead and declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you guys all very much for a good discussion, good participation, and as always jumping in. Be good, be well, enjoy, and we'll be in touch regarding the uh, progress efforts for the upcoming meeting. So take care, anything else in the meantime, always feel free to reach out and have a good one, everybody.